Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a new species of dinosaur with a sail along its back has been unearthed in England. It's officially been recognised that giraffes are four species, not just one. A tiny new moon has been discovered orbiting Uranus and much more. Our top story this week is the discovery of a new species of sailback dinosaur from England. It lived about 125 million years ago and was uncovered from rocks along the coast of the UK's dinosaur island, the Isle of Wight. It's a new kind of iguanodontian dinosaur, so it's a member of that great and widespread lineage that includes all the hadrosaurs, the so-called duck-billed dinosaurs, and their various relatives. Coming from the early Cretaceous period, this new species lived at an important time in the evolution of these dinosaurs. As the Iguanodontians were increasing significantly in diversity, from relatively low levels during the older Jurassic period, to the higher levels they achieved towards the end of the early Cretaceous, and maintained into the late Cretaceous. The new dinosaur has been named Istiorachus macartherae, and it's known from a partial skeleton including various vertebrae, small pieces of ribs, and some of the hip bones. Very interestingly, the blade-like processes projecting from the tops of the vertebrae, called the neural spines, are notably elongated along the back and tail in Asteorachus, meaning that this new dinosaur species would have had a sail along its back. Although the most well-known sailback dinosaur is of course Spinosaurus, there are actually a few other iguanodontians with elongated neural spines such as the early Cretaceous Morelodon and Uranosaurus. Additionally, the later Cretaceous Hadrosaurids, Hypacrosaurus and Barsboldia, possessed quite tall spines as well. The study describing Istiorachus therefore examines the broader evolutionary trends of sails in Iguanodontians, investigating how neural spine elongation evolved within the group over time. They found that slight elongation of the spines could be initially detected in the late Jurassic with some of the earlier members and this then became a more common feature during the early Cretaceous, although there was considerable variation in spine length among different species, and true hyperelongation of the spines is still quite rare. The evolution of longer neural spines in multiple iguanodontian species at different times probably doesn't have a single explanation, the study found, as there is too much variation in how long they got. So perhaps in some species there was a biomechanical advantage, possibly to do with an increase in body mass or a shift to being more quadrupedal. However, in other cases, the development of a sail was likely driven by sexual selection, as they functioned as display structures to indicate fitness and attract mates. Istiorachus has spines that are particularly exaggerated even among other iguanodontians, suggesting that in this case, sexual selection is a plausible explanation. So, not only is Istiorachus a fantastic new species that sheds light on how sail-backed herbivorous dinosaurs evolved, but it also increases the known diversity of dinosaurs in the Wealden group of the Isle of Wight, which in recent years has seen the discovery of two new Spinosaurs, two other Iguanodontians, a new Ankylosaur, a new Ornithopod, and a new Raptor. Also in this week's Paleo News, a new species of prehistoric turtle has been discovered in Colorado. Shell fragments from turtles related to modern snapping turtles are common fossils found in sediments dating to the late Cretaceous and the following early Paleocene epoch, across Western North America. However, more complete fossils are rare, so our understanding of early snapping turtle evolution has been limited. This research now describes a new species based on more complete fossils of shells, pelvic material, and skulls from the very early Paleocene of Colorado, about 66 to 65 million years ago, right after the extinction that wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs. It's named Tava Kelydra stevensoni, and it's a stem member of the snapping turtle family, meaning it's very closely related to the ancestors of modern species. It was found in sediments indicating a pond environment, and its skull anatomy shows that it was a durophagus feeder, meaning it consumed hard-shelled prey, such as shelled mollusks or crabs. Interestingly, many other fossil species recovered from this particular formation in Colorado were also durophagus, including unrelated turtles and a type of crocodilian. So durophagy seems to have been an advantageous lifestyle for freshwater reptiles immediately after the infamous mass extinction. What a wonderful new discovery. In other paleontology news, some very intriguing new results have been found after scientists investigated the evolutionary relationships of the so-called raptors, the dromaeosaurs and their relatives. The exact arrangement of the dromaeosaurs in relation to other close groups has long been debated among paleontologists, as several previous studies attempting to resolve their relationships have yielded contrasting results. 
This new research focused on a group of meat-eating dinosaurs from southern continents called the Unenlargiids, which are often considered a branch within the Dromaeosaurids. Using a comprehensive and extensive data matrix of theropod dinosaurs, combined with new observations based on recently available information about the Unenlargiids, the study demonstrated that these dinosaurs are not in fact dromaeosaurs, but instead form their own family level group, Unenlargiidae. The analysis also revealed that the Unenlargiids are closer to birds than dromaeosaurs are. Another finding was that the Halschiraptorines, a lineage of potentially semi-aquatic dinosaurs previously thought to be dromaeosaurs, are also elevated to family level, positioned outside dromaeosaurs as the closest lineage to the Unenlargiids. So these are some fascinating new hypotheses about their evolution that significantly shift the raptor family tree. Though of course, new discoveries always have the potential to alter these results in the future. Also in the recent news is a major report confirming that there are officially three new species of living giraffes. Giraffes had long been classified as a single species, Giraffa camelopardalis, with nine subspecies. However, in 2016, a genetic study revealed significant divergences between giraffe populations, which the study described as comparable to the differences between polar and brown bears, supporting the recognition of four giraffe species in total. This new report was conducted by the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Giraffe and Okapi Specialist Group, specifically their Giraffe Taxonomy Task Force, which sounds like a fantastic job. By reviewing the genetic evidence alongside differences in bone anatomy and geographical distribution, they confirmed that four giraffe species can be recognized, encompassing a total of seven subspecies. This report is vital for the conservation of these animals, as each giraffe species faces different threats. Recognizing this diversity means the risks to each genetically distinct species are no longer hidden behind the grouping of all giraffes under a single species. For example, the northern giraffe, which retains the name Giraffa camelopardalis, numbers little more than 7,000 individuals after losing around 70% of its population since 1995. Meanwhile, the southern giraffe, now known as Giraffa giraffa, has doubled in number to nearly 69,000 individuals. So this report is absolutely crucial for tailoring future conservation efforts to preserve all four of these iconic species. A rather hopeful conservation story up next, as a recently published report has found that a small Australian marsupial called the Amperta has recovered from near extinction. These rat-sized mammals were classified as endangered during the 20th century, but their numbers recovered enough to be classified as vulnerable by 2013, and then of least concern by 2019. This study examines their rate of expansion across Australia between 2015 and 2021, finding that despite an unprecedented period of drought hitting the country during this time, their range actually increased enormously. Such a recovery of an endangered species is a very rare event, and in the case of the Amperta, it seems to be mainly due to a reduction in the number of non-native cats which were preying on them. The severe drought also appears to have benefited the Amperta with their flexible diets and adaptations for low energy expenditure. So while other species suffered, they remained resilient. However, this trend is not guaranteed to continue, as the ecological modeling undertaken in the study indicates that future climatic changes will reduce the optimal niches for the Amperta, highlighting the need to mitigate these threats. And of course, one animal recovering does not mean that the ongoing biodiversity crisis isn't severely affecting other species, especially in Australia, which is suffering the worst mammal extinction globally. And finally for the news this week, a tiny new moon has been spotted orbiting Uranus. Astronomers used the James Webb Space Telescope to image the ice giant in February 2025 and have now revealed that a previously unknown moon has been detected using these images. The new satellite brings the total number of known moons of Uranus to 29. The new moon is currently known by the catchy name of S 2025 U1, and it's only 6 miles or 10 kilometers in diameter, which explains why it remained undetected when the Voyager 2 probe made its flyby of the planet in 1986, and why it has taken so long to be spotted by other telescopes. The moon orbits relatively close to Uranus, just at the edge of the planet's inner rings. As one of the astronomers on the team explains, no other planet has as many small inner moons as Uranus, and their complex interrelationships with the rings hints at a chaotic history that blurs the boundary between a ring system and a system of moons. Moreover, the new moon is smaller and much fainter than the smallest of the previously known inner moons, making it likely that even more complexity remains to be discovered. 
Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at sevendos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. Our patrons have been enjoying early previews of all of our recent 7 Days of Science scripts before the episodes themselves are released, so don't miss out on that. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Baffer, Diana Hernandez, Drov Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, Jeroen Zydovic, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Pripajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikas, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.